You're listening to the Voice of Islam Radio. Broadcasting on DAB and via the internet 24 hours a day. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Peace and blessings to all our listeners out there. Welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Uh, the time now is 7.24. We're going to jump straight into it. What I did forget is that we do have a Twitter poll. Uh, and the question on the Twitter poll is, and it's still open, do aliens exist? So please tweet us on Voice of Islam UK if you believe that they exist or if you don't. Or if you're one of those centrists, I like that word today, centrists, on the, on the, on the fence, maybe or maybe not. But let's jump into the first topic of discussion for today. Do aliens exist? And uh, yeah, just to so give us some preface on that. Referring back to the uh, to the poll, actually, fifty six percent of the people who have voted so far, okay. so far is the word Talib, okay. uh, so that you can breathe, uh, <laughs> uh, who have said actually that they do exist, and uh, NASA seems to agree. So, so NASA has actually set up a dedicated team mm -hmm. to finding for finding aliens and this is um the source is actually not my favorite um <laughs> uh, news channel uh, it's fox we don't news. have opinions but, here but I, but exactly. yeah, yeah, I don't have a choice there <laughs> so fox news one day ago published that uh nasa has set up a new team which is dedicated to finding aliens so if they're spending millions i'm sure on this project of theirs <clears throat> and so uh, as are other scientists uh, there must be um, there there must be some, some truth, truth yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah there, there yeah. must be some something. Uh, you know, there they must be smoking something. I should. Say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. I, I Why don't are think there I... so many drug references today? <laughs> <laughs> what is with you lot? Yeah, come on, just have a cup of tea and chill out. Look, you know, let's let's ask these kind of basic questions. Yeah, what are aliens? Yeah, extraterrestrial life, also called alien life, is life that occurs outside of Earth and that did not or originate from Earth. These hypothetical life forms may range from simple pro uh, prokaryotes to beings with civilizations far more advanced than humanity. The science of extraterrestrial life in all its forms is known as exobiology. Now, uh, within this, uh, th th you know, this, this is one of those questions, yeah, which, you know, has, I suppose, even since the 50s, uh, really actually had some uh, structure towards it actually with and I believe Sabat had said uh, with the inception of SETI yeah, the uh, uh, search into extraterrestrial intelligence out there and really it goes actually to the core of our beings yeah mm. what does this actually mean are we alone right exactly are we alone I think, absolutely I think that's the argument so the argument really is that in this vast experience expanse of the universe this ever expanding universe is it really possible that we we we're really alone uh there are billions and billions of of stars out there um uh, millions of galaxies if not more we um we have been uh, trying to find the ends of the universe so so hubble telescope was supposed to give us that uh, mm -hmm. probably more than a decade ago and all it found was that you know this is it's just a vast expanse it goes on and on and on mm -hmm. you know there are they're galaxies and then there are more galaxies and then there are more galaxies well the thing is Daniel you, what you've touched upon there is within this research of extraterrestrial life or proof if there is extraterrestrial life is really you've actually prefaced the Fermi paradox now if I tell our listeners out there the Fermi paradox is uh was f named after the physicist Enrico Fermi. And it's an actual uh, apparent con contradiction between the lack of evidence and high probability for the existence of extraterrestrial life. The basic points of the argument uh, are this. So it's, it's, it's an argument of logic, okay? There are billions of stars in the galaxy that are similar to the sun. And many of these stars are billions of years older than the solar system. With high probability, some of these stars have Earth-like planets. And if the Earth is typical, some may have uh, developed intelligent life. Some of these civilizations may have developed interstellar travel, a step to the Earth, uh, sorry, a step the Earth is uh, investigating now. 
even at the slow pace of currently envisioned uh, interstellar travel, the Milky Way galaxy could be completely traversed in a few million years. Now, according to this line of reasoning, uh, the Earth should have already been visited by extraterrestrial aliens uh, in an inf informal conversation. Fermi noted, no convincing evidence of this, leading him to ask the question, where is everybody? There have been many attempts to explain the Fermi paradox, primarily either suggesting that the intellect, uh, sorry, the intelligent extraterrestrial life is extremely rare or proposing reasons such as civilizations have not contacted or visited Earth because they don't like us. Right. Right, yeah, I added that, that last bit on, yeah. But come on, yeah. I, I can understand that, that, that train of thought, yeah, because look, everything is pointing. How can it be? How can it be? And then we're still hearing nothing. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As there was a pregnant yeah, pause in the yeah, studio. Exactly. So this I was waiting for absolutely, some, absolutely, yeah. some support, but don't don't worry, don't worry. But you know, luckily enough, we have some uh, you know some heavyweight callers uh, online today. And you're joined absolutely by uh, Doctor uh, uh, Doctor uh, Anders Sandberg, who is a researcher, science debater, futurist, transhumanist, and author. He's currently a James Martin Research Fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at the Oxford University. Good morning. Peace be with you. Thank you for joining. Good the morning. Show. Good morning, Doctor. Doctor Sandberg. Thank how you, are you so much. Thanks for joining us on the on the. On really the a pleasure show. to have you on the show, Doctor. It's great to be here. So uh, I started off with um, pointing out the Fermi paradox to all our listeners out there. I hope I didn't, li you know, in layman's terms. You know, what is that then? Is that just, uh, let's, let's, let's put it this way, an argument of pie in the sky? Because it's just pointing out a, 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 a line of thinking. It is a line of thinking. It's basically Enrico Fermi asking, where is everybody? The universe is enormously large and very old. And it looks like if intelligence emerges, we ought to be able to notice it. Mm -hmm. But we don't see anybody. So what's going on? Okay. So, okay. In answer to that, uh, I'm going to flip the question. So wouldn't something like the pyramids be, uh, you know, these ancient you know uh buildings that are around like the pyramids the nazca lines aren't they evidence not really uh, we tend to be very impressed by them but explaining them by aliens kind of misses the fact that we have uh, some of the egyptian paperwork about the salaries of the people actually building them mm -hmm. and we, we of course tend to say oh ancient civilization couldn't possibly have done that something super advanced must have done it but we shouldn't underestimate our ancestors. It doesn't seem to be much evidence that aliens have ever visited Earth. Okay, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, well, you wouldn't agree with uh, some of the circumstantial evidence that these were, um, you know, uh, built with the help of aliens. Then, so there's no proof uh, in not, that sense. Not really. Uh, literally, they don't show up in the accounting we have from ancient Egyptians. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> so they weren't noted then. So, so uh, Dr. Sandberg, then, in your opinion, what are the chances um, for the argument that there is a possibility of the existence of aliens? Uh, that is a bit tricky, of course, because you want to calculate those chances from something. And we have our own existence and the apparent absence of aliens to start from. And that's not much to you know, begin with. So in a paper I wrote, we used various statistical methods to try to refine the question. And we concluded that given current scientific uncertainties about the origin of life, how hard it is to evolve intelligence, etc., there might be up to a third of a chance that we're alone in the universe. Mm -hmm. But then again, there might also be a fairly big chance that there are aliens out there. We just haven't searched far enough. So I'm open for any of these possibilities, but we should uh, not be too surprised if it turns out that it's actually quite hard to get intelligent beings. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in terms of that, yeah, can we, you know, I, I've been given some research regarding the Drake question, or sorry, not the question, the Drake equation. And is this, I mean, is this another one of those real hypothetical um, equations that you know we have these uh, variables in there which really we do, we can't put a, a figure to 
the American astronomer Jill Tarter put it very nicely uh, when she said, this is a wonderful way of organizing our ignorance and uncertainty. <laughs> so the Drake equation, you combine the things uh, we guess at, but you can see how they affect each other. Mm-hmm. So, for example, one of the terms is how many planets are there in the Milky Way? Mm-hmm. And when it was proposed in the 60s, we had no clue. Mm-hmm. Now we actually have a very good idea that most stars have planets. So that term, we got it nailed down. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, there is another term, the probability of uh, life appearing on a randomly selected planet. And we have very little clue. We have an enormous uncertainty. But that also tells us as researchers, we really need to get going at that. We need to do experiments. We need to think carefully about, can we detect life on remote planets? And that is going to reduce our ignorance quite tremendously. On that question also, Dr. Sandberg, don't you think that our science actually is very, is rather primitive at this stage, given that, um, so my argument would be that, uh, you know, we found out whether Pluto was a planet or not only recently when I was growing up, um, uh, I, Pluto was a planet, and then <laughs> <laughs> then we discovered that it's not. So the point that I'm trying to make is that it's um, it, it, that our science um, is is rather primitive at this stage, and and therefore we are just not able to reach out into the vast expanse of the universe. Uh, it's very true that we're at an enormously primitive stage. We haven't been doing science really for that many centuries yet. I think we have gone rather far. We can say some things with pretty good confidence, while we also know that we are very likely to be surprised by other things. So in a normal scientific paper, you try to study something, and then you try to also estimate how much uncertainty do I get here. Mm -hmm. But that is, of course, based on your known uncertainty and known ignorance. The really hard part is unknown unknowns. So generally, we can't say that there aren't super civilizations out there communicating ways we can't detect. But we can be fairly certain that mm, there are not super civilizations of particular kinds we have imagined, because people have been looking for them, or civilizations like ours very, very close by. And that gives us some information, not enormously much, and uh, we need to take that into account. So it's a gradual building up. So once upon a time, we believed that the solar system was full of intelligent life. People assumed that, of course, there must be people on Mars and the moon. And at least we have kind of ruled them out because by now they would be complaining about the robots arriving all the time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Stop littering our our front door. (laughs) Quite indeed. Uh, Mars is the only planet in the solar system inhabited solely by robots right now. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean... this this goes to the heart of the question you know, of, of existence of uh, life out there. Yeah, I mean, why is it? You know, what is the importance of the existence of extraterrestrial life in relation to human beings on the Earth? I think it has to do with our desire to understand what is our place in the universe. Mm-hmm. Are we unique? Uh, how much should we care about the planet? I think even if it turned out that every planet in the universe had life and intelligence, we would still want to care about the Earth. But if we're alone, we might actually have even more reason to be extremely careful with our planet, our own future. Mm-hmm. So in the Drake equation, the final term is the, a very ominous term about the lifespan of intelligent life. Mm-hmm. And it might be very short. Maybe intelligence is common, but it doesn't last very long. That would be very, very bad news. And it's the main reason, actually, our institute are interested in researching this, because maybe looking at the sky will tell us something about our own future. But from the opposite perspective, maybe intelligent life, once it emerges, can become wise enough to survive for a long time. Mm -hmm. And again, we would ideally want to be able to see something in the stars telling us about those chances. As a a scientist, um, Dr. Sandberg, what do you make of the recent news that a UFO was spotted on the other side of the sun? Uh, I haven't heard that one, but people <laughs> constantly see unidentified objects. Uh, and so, but we see weird things in the sky all the time. That's right. not surprising. Uh, it's rather when we observe that, okay, this actually is well documented and doesn't look like anything else. That's when science really gets interested. For a while ago, uh, we had a lot of interest about a particular star, nicknamed Tabby Star, that had a really weird spectrum. We still don't know what it is, 
But for a while, people felt maybe that is alien super civilization building something. Mm-hmm. Now we can somewhat rule that out, but uh, there is still quite a lot of surprises when you look out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, why? Why, if you say you know that, that there is this line of reasoning that there must be alien civilizations out there, or you know, extraterrestrial civilizations that, and you know, intelligent ones at that. Yeah, and the most we have been developing at different rates. So some civilizations, if they're out there, will have been, you know, a millennia before us. So uh, at this particular point in time, it, say on the Earth, and to the, relative to their time, they would have developed their technology such that, you know, interstellar travel or traveling close to the speed of light is a possibility. Why have those civilizations, do you think, uh, you know, <laughs> why haven't they contacted us? And there, there are some uh, theories saying that, well, maybe we're wise and we don't want to interfere with primitive civilizations because, well, we have a human uh, experience, of course, of uh, many societies of different levels meeting and it hasn't always gone so well. The problem is, of course, how do you actually keep the alien teenagers from doing tricks? What about uh, the, the alien missionaries showing up and w- wanting to hand us uh, their tracks? I don't think that explanation works very well. Similar mm-hmm. explanations exist that maybe we're so technical advanced that we're all spending the time inside computers, running very fast, playing their computer games, and not caring about the universe. But all of these explanations assume that all aliens, all members of a civilization, no matter how alien they are, behave in the same way. And that wouldn't be true for us humans. Mm-hmm. So I don't think these explanations work very well. The interesting part is, of course, a super civilization, a really advanced one, is probably going to be noticeable, just like noticing a big city on Earth is easy. Not because we want people to notice cities, but just accidentally. The highways, the streetlights, the advertisements, Mm -hmm. the radio transmissions make it fairly obvious to anybody visiting the planet that uh, that's something uh, artificial. So we might hope that uh, to notice artificial things out in space if it's really advanced civilization. But that is, of course, a guess. And many people have said that maybe we're parochial, maybe we just think that they're going to be like us and they're so alien we can't recognize them. Mm, okay. Right, uh, Dr. Sadwick, thank you very much for joining us on The Breakfast Show. It was really a pleasure to have you. And we hope to well, have you on the show at, uh, at some time, probably, hopefully, not in too distant the future. Okay, thank you for joining us on The thank Breakfast Show. Thank you very show. much. Right, that was interesting. Um, Talib, I think you have some clips to play. Yeah, we went out on the road just to find out, you know, what do aliens exist? So just listen to some of these clips. I do believe in aliens because if we as humans exist inside the Milky Way and there is the possibility of mm, thousands of other galaxies out there, then the chances are that there are there is a planet like Earth and a sun that allow life to be born? Um, No, I don't believe in aliens as there is no concrete evidence that there is life outside Earth. No, I don't believe in aliens because when God created the universe, the only planet he created life on was Earth. Do I believe in aliens? Well, actually, yes, I do. Uh, For two reasons. One, Um, The likelihood of there not being some other life form out there is so small. So in terms of law of averages, and when you look at a wider literature review of academics, etc., they would say that, yes, there is, but it may just be, you know, bacteria, etc., life form, whatever. Maybe there isn't life forms that are, are as smart as human beings on Earth. And then secondly, and most bizarrely, I am pretty sure that when I was nine years old, I saw a spaceship outside of my window. True story. No, I don't believe in aliens. I would like to think that there's something else out there, maybe spiritually, but I don't believe in aliens. Um, Who knows, maybe we're the aliens since there's no other life on another planet. Assalamualaikum. Peace and blessings to all our listeners out there. Uh, welcome back to the breakfast show. So that was a few kind of like street interviews. So a bit mixed reactions uh, regarding do aliens exist. So I mean, I think that's that's what uh, Doctor 
Sandberg actually framed for us here yeah, that there is this hypotenuse, this this f theory, i.e. the Drake equation, which has all those variables out there, but it's it's one of those fill in the blanks. As I think the point that you pointed out, uh, Danielle, is that our science is, I suppose, on a uh, time scale quite rudimentary, right. and uh, as the more you know advances that science uh, makes these variables within the drake equation will be um i suppose corrected yeah or become more precise i would say and thus giving us that that number which is i mean ultimately the drake equation comes up with a number and that number uh symbolizes um the, you know the number of broadcasting civilizations that are actually out there um so who's to know i mean what's your personal view on this i i actually would like to bring uh, uh sabat sab in into into this discussion yes, but very good but before we uh, do that uh if any of you uh have any comments out there please uh call us at zero two zero eight six eight seven seven eight seven eight if you want to participate if you believe in aliens if you don't believe in aliens um please call us or tweet us at voice of islam uk sabat sab uh, what is um, Islam's perspective on this or, or or is there an Islamic perspective? Uh, is there something in the Quran that that we can refer to about um, extraterrestrial life? You know, um, there are uh, three levels of this discussion um, ever since 1944 um, when I guess life was defined in a manner that made it possible to look for something out there. Um, the definition obviously is way too technical, but to, to, to cut it short, anything that counteracts or is able to resist the law of entropy, that is the outward diffusion of, of um, anything that exists, any matter that exists into equilibrium. What this means is that if something Thank you. Yeah, please does English. not. <laughs> yeah, that was this. I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> the, um, uh, if something does not naturally try to become one with the universe, mm -hmm. in 1944, um, Edward uh, Schwarzinger, he said that there is a great chance that there is life there. Mm -hmm. And now this gave us our first opportunity to be like, okay, that means, because that means that there's some force counteracting what otherwise passive objects would just follow, mm -hmm. right? So if there's a stream, for example, going one way, mm -hmm. there are three things that will happen. One thing will just flow with the stream if it's dead, if mm -hmm. there's no life. One thing may be able to just stand there against the stream, but it would be a peg or a rock that is held down under the ground or something mm. like that. That's still not life. Life, I'm trying to, I guess, make it analogous so mm. that this definition is Fighting the current. Exactly. Something going upstream. Mm -hmm. That is enough to indicate life. Now, what's interesting is that the Holy Quran talks about three different levels. And the first level that it talks about is that we have created, God says, seven heavens. And for each of the heavens that we have created, meaning seven uh, layers to the uni uh, universe at large, to each we have given it its own earth. This is the first level of discussion. And that's the first level of discussion when SETI was established, even before that, but especially in 1966 when, 66, when uh, Carl Sagan really, you know, jump-started this entire thing. At that time, he said that there are two prerequisites required for life to exist on any planet. Number one, the right star, mm -hmm. and a planet the right distance from the star. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why the history of SETI is so integral to the discussion when we talk about Islam. Because it is as though these three steps to the investigation of life have been laid out in the Holy Quran 1400 years ago. So scientists were excited because they did some number crunching and they came to the conclusion that there should be by way of these two. At that time, they knew that there were no less than one octillion planets, mm -hmm. one followed by 24 zeros. And 
by way of this equation, these two parameters, they called them the per, uh, life parameters, they said there should be one septillion planets that har harbor life. That's one followed by 21 zeros. Mm -hmm. They were ecstatic. That's why this entire project started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a whim based off of a whim based off of a whim. The Holy Quran says, don't start acting on just theory. You should have some substance, at mm -hmm. least. Nonetheless, it was started. Now, one aspect that perhaps is very integral to this discussion is that um, does life or, or can a planet like Earth exist at all? And the Holy Quran says two things that are really important. Number one, it says you will never find any incongruency in the creation of the gracious God. Mm -hmm. And it says, Farji <laughs> il-Basar, go look again. Meaning, go look again and yet again. So four times it invites. Your eyes will only return to you weary and tired. You will not find any inconsistency. This is very integral in the search for aliens because it supports what scientists have just concluded in the last maybe 15 years or so. Mm. They were theorizing up until about 15 years ago, our leading scientists at NASA and say in different uh, organizations, that perhaps the laws of physics bend here and there in the universe. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Quran says no. There's, an, there's a perfect consistency. and You can keep looking and looking and looking and looking. You'll grow tired, but you won't find it. This laid down the parameters for searching for, for life. And, but the problem is, and I'll close with this, because then I, may, maybe we can go to the second level of discussion, is that the parameters didn't remain at two after the uh, electromagnetic signals were sent out um, they became four, and those four became 400, and more, uh, and it continued to increase to this extent that that w number of one septillion possible uh, life harboring planets has grown so infinitesimal and has fallen so deep into the decimals that the Earth should not exist. Mm -hmm. And that's why now people are growing a little bit skeptical and saying, hmm, maybe there is no life. But the problem is that the small probability or, or the, the smallness of the probability of the earth existing is nothing compared to the smallness of the probability that the universe went from a state of non-existence to existence. Mm -hmm. It is infinitely, infinitely greater. So there's a second case and point. So there are four points in the existence of the universe three aside from the earth uh, life forming on the earth whose uh, probability of it having happened is infinitely greater than this which theoretically speaking in the world of probability opens three doors to saying that aliens most certainly can exist so with that so uh, on the first argument that you presented <clears throat> is that is that a case so these uh, the seven heavens and earth for uh, for each um, uh, for each universe is is that is that really a case for um, in scientific parlance a parallel universe? Well, that I was uh, hoping to get to later, but now that you've brought it up, the it, overarching it actually theme, it's about sub, mm -hmm. if I can ask you to hold that thought, yeah, yeah, we are we are joined by Dr. Andrew Simeon, um, who is an astrophysics physicist. astrophysicist and director of uh, the Berkeley SETI Research Center. His research interests include high energy time variable, celestial phenomena, astronomical instrumentation, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Good morning, peace be with you, uh, Mr. Andrew Simeon. Simeon. Good morning, good morning. Have I pronounced your name me. correctly? Yes, Simeon. Simeon, right, okay. Thank you very much, sir, for, for joining us um, on The Breakfast Show. Uh, my first question would be, uh, is there any, is there any evidence to suggest that there is life on any other planet? Well, the biggest piece of evidence that we have that life exists elsewhere is the fact that life exists on this planet, on planet Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've learned in the last couple of decades that planets like the Earth are very common in our galaxy and indeed in the universe. Our own Milky Way galaxy probably has between 50 and 100 billion planets uh, just like the Earth in terms of their their size and their temperature. So uh, as, as astronomers and, and astrobiologists, astrophysicists, we ask the question, well, if, uh, if, if life exists on Earth, does it exist uh, on, on these other planets? 
So what about the um, uh, the argument that is presented from the other side, the, the Fermi paradox? What would you say to that? Yeah, well, it's a it's a great it's a great point. Of course, the the Fermi paradox is a, an observation that's often uh, attributed to the physicist Enrico Fermi, which is that if if life exists elsewhere, uh, why haven't we detected it yet? Mm-hmm. Why haven't we we seen it? There are lots of answers to to that question. Um, one answer is that maybe it's it's very difficult for life to travel between the stars, uh, especially intelligent life. We know that it's it's very expensive energetically. It takes a a lot of fuel, a lot of energy to, to transport mass between the stars. So maybe it's just not worth it for intelligent life to, to move between the stars. Um, another answer is that perhaps uh, we just haven't recognized it yet. Um, perhaps there is a, 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 a galactic internet, uh, a, a galactic network of, of communicating and perhaps even traveling civilizations that we just haven't seen yet in our experiments. I mean, is there uh, any evidence supporting the other side or really supporting this this side of the Fermi paradox which is that there is no one there well absolutely or there, there is, is no ex- um, you know extra extraterrestrial life well, out there can be no extraterrestrial yeah. life rather sure well you know we've certainly examined our solar system in great detail of course we've sent spacecraft to the surfaces of many of the other bodies in our, our solar system we've um, imaged um, you know, virtually every every rock that we can find in our solar system, and we see absolutely no evidence for any life on any uh, any body in our solar system other than than the Earth. And so that tells us that life uh, is probably fairly rare. Um, that it's not not obvious that in, in any environment where life could emerge uh, that that it does and that it that it thrives. Uh, so we know that the probability of of life uh, emerging and existing is is small. Um, we know that from the, the observations that we've done, but we also know that there are a huge number of opportunities for life to emerge. Um, and so the product of those two values could end up being uh, one. It could end up being a few thousand, a few tens of thousands. Uh, we just don't know the answer. And of course, that's why that's why the search for life is such a compelling scientific question. Mm-hmm. Um, Mrs. Evian, if um, there was truth to the argument that there has been uh, visits uh, of ex- extraterrestrial beings on Earth. Do you think the sci- our science is developed enough to be for us to to be able to detect that? Do you think it's possible that somebody may have visited visited us? Well, the the surface of the Earth um, recycles uh, on uh, very short time scales relative to the the age of the the Earth. The Earth is. 4.6 billion years old uh, or so, and the, the surface of, of the Earth, many many parts of it, um, can be can be recycled, um, uh, covered by by geological processes, in, in a fraction of that time, in, in 50 or 100 million years. So it's it's quite possible if there were such such evidence that it's now uh, many many miles um, beneath the surface of the Earth or, or the surface of the ocean somewhere, and, and we just don't know. Um, that said, we see absolutely no evidence. Uh, that the Earth has ever been visited by any other uh, intelligent life, mm-hmm. so um, you know, we we don't we don't we don't know the answer to that, and, and it's a very difficult difficult question to determine the answer to. I mean, why? Is, I mean, my my last question regarding this, uh, you know, extraterrestrial life, yeah, is that would you you know support all this? Uh, you know, the Hollywood films that come out there that you know. Alien life is actually, if there is the existence of alien life or extraterrestrial life, it would be a threat to our own humanity. Well, we, we certainly have no reason to believe that um, technological advancement is accompanied by altruism, by, by morality. Uh, that is to say that we don't have, have any evidence that as life becomes more technologically advanced, it gets any friendlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we, we, don't, we don't know. Um, whether the first life that we encounter, the first intelligent life that we encounter, will be uh, benign or, or, or malevolent, um, and that's um, you know something that that we'll have to have to determine when we interact with it. But of course, the the thing that we have going for us is that this life is inevitably going to be very very far away, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so we hopefully won't have to have to worry about it um, for, <laughs> so for any time soon. We'll we'll see them on the horizon then. Your point. Indeed. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Simeon, on the breakfast show today.
Sure, thank you for having me. Thank you. Peace be with you. Time, I think, for the 8 o'clock news, and uh, we'll come back right after the news and continue with our discussion on um, uh, what the Islamic angle is around yeah, we need extremism. To, we, we need to kind of, like, uh, flesh it out, yeah. You are listening to the recording of a live show. Please do not call or text, as this is a recording, and lines are now closed. as alaikum. Peace and blessings to all our listeners out there. Welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Time now is 8.03 on Wednesday, the 20th of February. We're just uh, going to wrap up our first topic regarding the existence of extraterrestrial beings. I'm going to pass it over to Sabah Sab to give us the Islamic take. I mean, we did touch it on it briefly, but if you can just wrap, a, wrap up and give us the sucker punch. I guess um, the Holy Quran is very emphatic in its declaration. It says, firstly, and I go back very quickly to when Seti started this, the first question that arose was, are there Earth-like planets? Mm -hmm. The Holy Quran declared this 1400 years ago, that in the heavens, as you explore them, they are, they are infinitely expansive. And for each new territory in the heaven that you discover, you will find Earth-like planets. Al-Arda Mithlahun in Arabic literally means that they are all like one another. Now, this is the first level of discussion. The second level of discussion that scientists have taken up are um, about whether aliens exist or not. And right now, science is at a standstill in the way of empirical and tangible evidence. Mm -hmm. However, the Holy Quran says that it is God who created the heavens and the earth, وَمَا بَثَّ فِيهِمَا And all that lives therein. Now, somebody might argue that, oh, well, here the heavens by heavens is meant uh, the, the uh, spiritual beings like angels and whatnot. But actually, the word that proceeds after this is min dabbatin. Mm -hmm. Dabbatin exactly refers to earth bound creatures, mm -hmm. physical creatures. In the Arabic language, the word dabbatin cannot and has never been used for angels. It has never been used for spiritual beings. It is only used for physical, tangible beings that are bound to the earth <coughs> by gravity. So the Holy Quran says that there are dabbatin, such physical creatures, be they bacteria or whatnot, in the heavens, and as this is, well this as is verse forty-two, chap. Sorry, verse forty-two, chapter thirty, isn't it? Chapter I think forty-two and verse thirty. Sorry, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, then, at the end of that, it says, "Wahua Allah, jamrihim la qadir," right? Ida mm yasha -hmm. qadir. Uh, and what this means is that and God, the same God who created the heavens and the earth, meaning he's the one who brought about these generally or otherwise impossible life forms. He is also very capable whenever he wants. Ida <coughs> yasha. And Ida is used for time. That whenever he wants, he can bring them together. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that God never uses the word Qadir for something that he would not do. Okay. That's a very important point to raise. God is, will, will not ever willy-nilly, you will not find a single example of the Holy Quran where God says that I am Qadir, meaning I have power to do something, and he doesn't actually intend to do it. From this, the language of the Quran tells us that this is prophecy, that this will happen, and God is saying that whenever I want, I will bring you together. This is interesting because now I close uh, with a couple points about the search for life. God says that he can bring them together. Human beings have been trying. There are a lot of scientific flaws in what we've been trying. Firstly, Carl Sagan pointed out that humans arrived on the 24-hour clock of the history of, <coughs> of, the, uh, of the, uh, the Earth sorry, um, at 11.59 p.m. and 46 seconds. Mm -hmm. That's when we arrived at about 58 between 58 and 59 seconds, we sent out the first signal in the clock uh, of the Earth. In the overall scheme of things. Mm -hmm. It has been less than a sec. It has been several milliseconds. That's it, at most, that we've sent out these signals. Now, uh, another thing that's really flawed is that we are assuming by sending out electromagnetic signals that the life out there also is advanced enough 
to listen to, acknowledge, appreciate that this came from somewhere and then send it back. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the main arguments that they present is, well, we've already reached 600 trillion miles away from the Earth, which means uh, several, several light years, several light years. A uh, about a hundred light years. It's almost exactly a hundred light years as of two or two or three years ago, if I'm not mistaken. The problem is that if it just reached there today, a hundred and some, a hundred and some years are going to, it will take at least mm -hmm. for them to respond. If they respond as soon as they receive it, mm -hmm. but if they are intelligent enough to respond, they're going to investigate it. They may just ignore it. Mm -hmm. For example, a few years ago, last year actually, there was a very powerful signal received that was investigated for several months and they realized it was an explosion that took place 130 million years ago, they concluded. Mm -hmm. um, two neutron stars, which fun fact are stars that are only 10 kilometers in radius, but a teaspoon of its mass is a, billion, is a million tons. So they collided. <laughs> heavy star, man. Yeah, very. <laughs> so um, long, long story short, the investigation is flawed. Now, if it's m microbacteria, how is an electromagnetic signal that was sent out even a thousand years ago going to do anything? Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's one other, I mean, there are a few other, but there's only, oh, there's one other thing of uh, actually tangifying whether there is life or not. That is called biomineralization, but we can barely make it a light year away with, with uh, you know, radaring and, and uh, honing in on biomineralization. So the investigation is so limited right now that it is way too scientifically premature to conclude that there are no aliens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's a very good point to end with. We're going to go to a short break. Please join us after the break where we'll be dealing with another hot, hot topic. Uh, the, I suppose, of say the battle of the sexes who is more intelligent females or males so if you have a comment regarding this please call us on 0208 687 7878 or tweet us on voice of islam uk